Welcome to the Next Generation Leader Podcast, where we believe great leaders are listeners, especially during their youth. Good leaders learn from their successes and mistakes, but great leaders learn from the successes and mistakes of those who go before them. I'm your host, Zach Funderburg, and I'm excited to share this episode with you. The great British bulldog Winston Churchill once said, to each there comes in their lifetime a special moment when they are figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered the chance to do a very special thing unique to them and fitted to their talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds them unprepared or unqualified for that which could have been their finest hour. And that's the heartbeat behind our podcast. I don't want one day me or you to be tapped on the shoulder, offered the chance to do something great, and you're sitting there finding yourself unprepared or unqualified for that which could have been your finest hour. So that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. We're here to learn, we're here to listen, and we're here to get guidance from the wisdom of those leaders who have gone before us. And with that as our guiding principle, there's no better person to learn from than our guest today, Kimberly Reed. Kimberly Reed served as the president and chairman of the board of directors of the Export-Import Bank of the United States from 2019 to 2021. She was the first woman to lead XM in the agency's 87-year history and was the first recipient of XM's highest honor, the Franklin D. Roosevelt Award. Kimberly is recognized as one of the 100 women leaders in STEM, Washingtonians, most powerful women in Washington, and West Virginia executive lawyers and leaders. She also served at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where she headed the Community Development Financial Institution Fund, where she oversaw the award of $4 billion in tax credits, loans, and grants to financial institutions and economic development groups investing in distressed communities around the nation. She also served as the president of the International Food Information Council. So with that resume, there's a lot to learn from. But what we really wanted to talk to her about was her role at XM. The Export-Import Bank of the United States provides loans, guarantees, and export credit insurance for the export of U.S. goods and services from enterprises ranging from Fortune 100 companies to small businesses in a multitude of sectors including infrastructure, power, agriculture, transportation, aviation, healthcare, commodities, and technology. We want potential customers from around the world buying from U.S. businesses instead of foreign competitors. XM provides financing to help the world buy Americans so that U.S. businesses, including small businesses and workers, can be even more successful in the competitive global marketplace. So what we do is we want people around the world buying American because when the world buys American, Americans have jobs. We want that. That is the goal. And so that's what we talk about today. We ask Kimberly Reed, what does it look like to, to work there, to start that? And how did your leadership inspire jobs and create jobs within the Trump administration? It's a fascinating conversation. And I can't wait to share. It. So without further ado, here she is, Kimberly Reed. Well, Kimberly, it's an honor to, to be on a Zoom call with you and just get to ask you some questions uh, we were discussing before. What's all on your plate? And I know that you are a rather busy lady at the moment. And so I just want to thank you for taking some time to, to speak with me and to answer some questions about your background, what you're doing and some of the issues in our country and how the next generation of leaders uh, can take their stand and, and make changes in the world. But first, I want you to start by just introducing yourself. Kind of who are you? What was your path to get to where you are today? Well, thank you so much, uh, Zach, and I'm so honored to be with you and the next generation of leaders. That's right. Uh, My name's Kimberly Reed. I grew up in West Virginia, a little town called Buchanan, West Virginia. Went to undergrad at a school called West Virginia Wesleyan College, a small Methodist private liberal arts college, and law school at West Virginia University. Um, After law school, I moved to Washington, D.C. because I loved policy, and uh, even though I was a pre-med and undergrad, I ended up going to law school, and that's a story in itself, but uh, but I moved to D.C., worked on Capitol Hill uh, for seven years, and I recommend that anyone who has the slightest bit of interest in policy, go get a job on the Hill, whether you're an intern or a full-time staffer, um, make, make that, make that a uh, part of your life experience because you can't study that in school. You have to yeah. do it. Um, so I worked on Capitol Hill for three committees doing oversight and investigations. Mm. And that's very important as we read in the news every day, Congress uh, really cares about uh, representing the taxpayer and the American public and making sure things are uh, going as they should in our country. So I was a part of that. I then went to the Treasury Department 
uh, where I was senior advisor to two US Treasury secretaries, uh, Treasury Secretary John Snow and uh, Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson. And Zach, since you're in Dallas right now, um, these were the Treasury Secretaries to uh, President George W. Bush. And, it is. Uh, and, uh, a Dallas native. We love him. We've had him on campus. And one of my favorite nights of college was when he came and spoke on campus. I loved it. He's a great man, a great man. And uh, I had the pleasure of being at uh, the opening of his presidential uh, library a few years ago. So um, that was great. So uh, so did that. Also, I uh, ran Treasury's only grant program called the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund, which helps provide grants and tax credits to stimulate um, economic development in poor parts of our country. Um, love doing that. Moved briefly up to New York, uh, worked up there for a financial firm, and then came back to Washington, um, where I turned to the science degree that I got in undergrad. I majored in biology and minored in chemistry and um, uh, was the head of an organization called the International Food Information Council Foundation. And uh, did that for about seven years, where I helped uh, communicate the science on food safety, nutrition, and health. And that was really interesting to work with over 400 health uh, professional, professionals and academicians to talk about everything from obesity to the latest food safety uh, uh, crisis that might be happening in our country or around the world to helping uh, uh, foreign countries appreciate how great America agri America's agriculture is and, uh, and why they should uh, think about um, enjoying uh, uh, the great crops that, that we make here in this uh, country where we have a safe, affordable and healthy food supply. Um, from that, I uh, uh, then went in uh, 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 to serve in government again, and I just concluded an uh, amazing tenure as the um, head of something called the Export-Import Bank of the United States, and I know we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I love being uh, the chairman of the board, president, and CEO of this organization. Well, you have a vast array of experiences, but I want to go back to where you started. You mentioned having an internship on Capitol Hill. I want, I, I read in an article, the story of how you got that internship based off advice from your dad. Can you tell that story of how you got there? Well, this was before the internet, probably. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was in law school and, uh, and uh, I really um, was interested in Washington. And so I don't know what story you read on me, Zach, but here's here. I hope this is the story um, that uh, that you read. And if not, it adds to the story that you I'm read. Sure it will. Because uh, I was in law school. I really wanted to work on Capitol Hill. And there's uh, a, a member of Congress that my dad worked for when I was a little girl. And his name was Bill Archer. And he was from Houston. My dad went to law school at South Texas College of Law. And uh, my dad worked for um, Congressman Archer, who actually had just filled this House of Representative seats held by George W. Bush's father, George oh. Herbert Walker Bush, so down yeah. in Houston. And uh, my dad said, drive to Washington, go into um, the House of Representatives, look that up on a map, walk into one of the buildings, and by each elevator, there's a list of all the members of Congress. And that and that list is still there. If you ever visit your, your House members or your senators, you can go and you'll find a list of all of their names and their, their room numbers. And my dad told me to drive to DC, go look up Bill Archer's name, and go to his office and knock on the door and ask to speak with the chief of staff. And uh, the chief of staff, um, mind you, I was in law school at the time. So this was about 1995, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I just showed up cold and asked to speak to the chief of staff, a man named Don Carlson. And Don comes out and he's like, I remember you when you were five years old, come with me. Uh -huh. And he walks me straight into um, the Ways and Means Committee's tax office, asked to speak to the chief tax counsel. And he looks at uh, this, uh, this man and says, here's your summer law clerk. So that's, that's, that's how I got that internship. <laughs> it's a little bit different uh, today because we have email and application right. processes and all of that. But I think maybe uh, we'd have to ask uh, Mr. Carlson, but I think I showed gumption. I think <laughs> that's right. And grit. <laughs> grit, gumption and grit. Those are the perfect words for it. But I think there are parallels to, the, to today, even though we have, I mean, uh, emails and all of that to make those connections. But there's something about just going and being forward with it 
sending that email. So many people probably have emails in their, their outbox that, or their, their drafts that they haven't sent. But we want to encourage you just to send that email. You never know where it might take you. And then you go from being that intern in that office to being one of the Washingtonians' most powerful women in Washington. And you were the first woman uh, president and chairman of XM. And we'll talk about more of what XM is. But what did that mean to you, being uh, the first woman to lead that? What, what, was there a weight that you carried with that or some sense of, of pride in that? Um, I would say I have approached all of my jobs based on being a human being. Yeah. And, uh, and we hear so much in this time of me too, but also, uh, of my mother, uh, my mother's generation of women who came up, I was born in 1971. And so we hear a lot about what they did in the, in the women's uh, movement back then. And I know that I benefit from that. Mm. Um, but, uh, I feel my success is, uh, because of hard work. Mm. And, uh, and perhaps I've encountered challenges somewhere uh, along the way that I've not uh, been aware of directly, and maybe I've not been selected for things uh, because I'm a woman, but um, I feel that I've had a lot of opportunities because I'm a hard worker and and dedicated. Um, but when I was uh, confirmed at the Export Import Bank, which it's a beautiful office on the northeast corner of Lafayette Park overlooking the White House, a uh, truly stunning building. Um, and the view is uh, the best in Washington. I could see from my office the White House, uh, the, the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial, and you look across the river and you could see Arlington Cemetery and uh, uh, Kennedy's uh, flame at his grave. Oh. Uh, totally beautiful. And and, uh, but when I was first confirmed and walked to my new office, they had all these pictures of all of these men who go back to Exum's founding in 1934. And it's just a hall of um, hall of white men. And then now my picture is at the end of that. And, uh, Look at you. and, and uh, but I also like being the first West Virginian uh, was, uh, to, to be the head of the, of the agency as well, because I really was... Uh, during this oppor opportune time uh, to take the agency to a, a next level, I really wanted to bring awareness to um, rural America, mm -hmm. to small business, uh, to agriculture, and uh, in issues uh, that I thought uh, were important for success for um, the workers in our country. Yeah. So. I think that's such a great attest to the hard work, the gumption again, to if you're a hard worker, there's no telling where you could end up, what offices you could hold, uh, what place you could work. And uh, thank you for, for those just um, testaments to that. And you've also mentioned in that same article, it was a very insightful article, and it talked about you being in 4-H in West Virginia. Doing Is that what it was called? Yeah, 4-H. Uh, you need to know what that is. Good. Well, I do. But in <laughs> growing up in Missouri, they called it FFA, I believe. And oh, it's competing organization. Is it really? I'm so well, I'm so sorry. I wasn't a part of FFA, but I knew a lot of people that were. And so you talked about how this really taught you a lot of leadership lessons and how to present. And I also watched a lot of the the hearings that you had, the confirmation hearings. And different things where you were asked tough questions and you had to answer for how you're going to lead this organization. But can you talk about how that experience at the beginning of your life led to where and, and it helped you in those Senate or in those confirmation hearings? Absolutely. Um, 4-H, my mother died when I was nine years old in 1980. She was 32 years old. She had Hodgkin's disease, which is a very curable cancer today, but back then it was not. And so um, she left me and my uh, five-year-old brother, Mark, and uh, my dad, who was 29 at the time, and uh, a big, I'm sure a big medical bill for him to, to pay off as a, uh, as a young lawyer. And, uh, and so my dad, dad's parents, Avis and Max Reed, really stepped in to help my dad raise me and my brother. And uh, my grandmother, Avis Reed, uh, looked at me and I was a shy fourth grader. Can you imagine just going through this tremendous loss and having your yeah. world change instantly? Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she was not going to have any of that, no shyness. Yeah. And so she enrolled me in 4-H. And 4-H is a wonderful program. It's international now, but it helps develop what are the 4-Hs? head, heart, hands, and health, and, and helps develop that in a, a, a well-rounded person. You take projects, um, and that can be raising a calf or sewing, and I took cooking, and, and you um, uh, have to do your, your, your projects and get graded on them with uh, competitions, including something called a public demonstration contest. 
And uh, uh, my grandmother made me because uh, I wouldn't have done it on my own. And, and yeah. I know that's a fine balance, but she, she, she put me into environments that challenged me. And I think that we should all do that. I think it's important to, you grow by um, getting into uncomfortable situations where you feel like you would not be successful and try. And um, maybe you succeed sometimes and maybe you fail a lot of times, but you grow from it. And so public demonstration contest is where you have a, uh, something that you present to judges and you have an audience. And so my, my project was, how do you make hot cocoa, homemade hot cocoa? Yeah. And so you have to get your posters up and you have to present and you have to be uh, a, a good speaker, good eye contact. You're graded on all of these things. And then you have to answer questions from the judges. And my judges, I believe, included one of my teachers or maybe it was a principal from my school, but um, it was it was not easy. And yeah. then a judge asked me, so what's the nutrition content of your hot cocoa? And I had not studied that at all. <laughs> so yeah. what would you say? What would be your answer to that? I have, I have no idea. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I have no idea. I have no answer. So uh, I was glad I paid attention a little bit in science class because I knew mm. milk had vitamin D. And that's Something, yeah. Also milk has calcium. It's very good for your bones. Mm. And uh, I, know, I know I at least said those two items. Yeah. Uh, cold is a fourth right. grader, which is pretty good. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. I won. Well, good <laughs> but, for you. Do you still use the same hot cocoa recipe to this day? I don't. Oh no! I don't I'm sure that. it's evolved. And you much asked me now. to make hot cocoa. I would. I would. Okay. Um, okay. I drink water now, and I drink coffee. <laughs> Good. Well, that's that's okay. <laughs> I upgraded, so I Good use I use milk in my hot coffee. How about that? <laughs> there we go. There, there's some similarities there. Well, that, yeah, and it and it really does. And I wanted to hit that point that there are so many things that can be hard or difficult or experiences that you go through, like the loss of your mother or things that you try that someone pushes you to that are hard, but you don't know the benefit that that is going to bring you later in life. And that there are people that are for you and that see things in you. And they say, if you get through this hard thing, I promise you, it'll lead you to having grit. It'll lead you to having the gumption to go out and do and chase your dreams later in life. And I think that's such a great story and representation, just the small thing of presenting about hot cocoa and having to come up with the nutritional facts about it on the fly lead to to where you are today and where you were at xm so i kind of want to get into the senators asking me those hard questions if you watched any of my hearings testifying before congress and they ask hard questions too it's, they do they ask you much harder than the nutritional facts of hot cocoa and you were still poised and, and and it led to that and it was so helpful i'm sure in preparation for that hearing and then also sitting there answering those hard questions. And so that's just what I want people to, to remember from that. Uh, but I want to talk about XM and your role there. Kind of, I was unaware of really the role of XM and what y'all did uh, before doing more research. So kind of explain what is the role, what was your role at XM and then what's the role of XM within the country? So the Export Import Bank of the United States is an independent federal agency and it has 515 staff, uh, 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 375 full-time uh, government employees, and then a lot of contractors who help run the technology, which is so important as we uh, have uh, COVID happening in our country right now and, uh, and a lot of people telecommuting. But uh, EXIM, E-X-I-M, stands for Export Import Bank of the United States, was created back in 1934 by President um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and uh, it is our nation's official export credit agency or ECA. And that's just the generic term for what, what XM does. And it's generic because 116 other countries have an ECA, at least one. China has two official, several unofficial. And the mission of XM is the best mission I think in the world, which is supporting American jobs by facilitating U.S. exports. And so when you think about businesses in our country and you look at the world, the world is the global marketplace. We all, we all know this now. And uh, when we look at where we live and the companies that make things in our communities, uh, they can sell those in our communities, our countries, or they can access the global marketplace. 95% of the world's consumers 
potential customers live outside the United States. And so when you are a small business or a medium sized business or a big business, maybe that should be part of your plan. You want to be successful. You make a great product and you want the world to buy it. But a lot of times uh, those foreign buyers may have challenges if they want to buy something, maybe there's some issues where they can't get a loan from a private sector bank. And I don't know how many of your listeners have ever taken out a loan, but um, uh, sometimes that's needed to be able to buy what you want. Yeah. And so the U.S. Export-Import Bank was created to provide loans to foreign purchasers who want to buy made in the USA goods and services where they need that financing because a normal bank cannot give them a loan. And there's lots of reasons for that. And uh, also, Axim can help a private sector bank make a loan to a foreign purchaser by our guaranteeing that loan. And um, Axim also does some small things um, that are important to small businesses, something called export credit insurance. And I'll give examples of all of these um, to help small businesses export and feel confident when the foreign purchaser doesn't pay up on their promise. And so uh, uh, the Export Import Bank will uh, give export credit insurance to help make that uh, US company whole if that would ever happen. So here's an example of a loan. We're gonna make this uh, up as a hypothetical, okay? Um, uh, A country in Africa wants to buy um, tractors to help with agriculture and they wanna place a big order and the normal banks turn them down. And why would a normal bank turn them down? Maybe the bank is overextended in the country. They've done enough lending in that country. Maybe they don't quite have the confidence in what, what, they're, what they need to be doing to, to help this foreign purchaser. And so they don't wanna give the foreign purchaser a loan for let's make up a number, $100 million to buy tractors made in the United States by US workers. So that foreign purchaser, Uh, will come to us for an application and we would review it and have due diligence because we really want to protect the taxpayers, um, uh, the U.S. taxpayer who's providing that. And uh, and, uh, we judge each application based on a very important standard, reasonable assurance of repayment. We also charge that foreign purchaser fees and interest. So they'll pay back the loan and fees and interest in uh, USXM would cover our costs running our agency and then give the extra money that we get back to the US Treasury to help with running our country. And that could be in the form of reducing our federal uh, debt or um, maybe do a tax cut or whatever, whatever the US Treasury needs that extra money for. And uh, so, so we would provide that financing, or as I mentioned, uh, the, the private sector bank would make a loan and we would guarantee that loan in case uh, the foreign buyer um, didn't uh, make good on their payments. Yeah. We could also, if the foreign buyer would ever default on their payments back to the U.S. government, we could go and reacquire those tractors. And, and, uh, and uh, just like if you don't make good on your car payment, uh, yeah. the bank will come in and seize your car. So we could do that. And and just in closing, I want to say um, we have a very low default rate. And you ask any uh, financial institution. I was on a plane last night sitting next to a CEO of a a financial institution in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I said, Exim, when I was there, had anywhere between 0.5 and 0.8 uh, percent default rate. Is that good? He's like, yes. Yeah. And I ask all the banks and any banker who's listening, that's really good. So our staff uh, does a good job of underwriting and making sure our taxpayers protected. Hmm. Yeah. When you were talking, I sound, or I wrote down, like, is it risky? Cause if you're, if you're um, giving out to foreign, I mean, to a country to buy tractors from someone in America, but it makes it, it sounds like from the way you explained it, it's, it, it could be, but there's a lot of processes in between there to make sure that they're going to make right what they've borrowed. And then there's, there's processes on the back end to go in if they don't. Um, so how does the work you do at XM directly affect American jobs? What's the correlation there? What's the partnership? Um, everything uh, that we do is to support U.S. jobs. So we want the world to buy American. Yeah. And in fact, on my last day, I finished up at XM on um, January 20th by law. My term ended on right. January 20th. 
And uh, we created a new tagline, uh, uh, my last day on the job, helping the world buy American. Hmm. And, and I mentioned um, every major country in the world now has their own ECA or XM at their, in their country. And so if you're a foreign buyer, let's go back to a random country in Africa. Let's say you have a choice between buying tractors from America, tractors from China, tractors from France. Um, uh, uh, what does America want uh, them to choose? Us, right? right. And so there are export credit agencies in each of these countries offering that financing to say, come pick our country. And, uh, and so um, uh, the, the good thing about the United States is we make the best products in the world. And right. uh, the world tells us uh, that. And, uh, and so if we're needed, we want to help uh, seal the deal and help, uh, help the world buy American. So, I mean, how could you not love that? And I love it. Helping the world buy American. That's the goal. We want, our, uh, we want financial incentives to get U.S. companies to move their, their supply chains or to keep their supply chains onshore. And I read even while XM was closed before you were appointed, there was a lot of financial incentives to go offshore. And so a lot of that was lost and why we were having to buy foreign products rather than helping the world buy American, like what you had said. And there's a lot of free market uh, supporters who aren't big fans of XM in with the work that y'all do. Why is that? What, what is the, the disconnect there? Well, let me, let me step a, back, uh, a bit back. Um, I'm Republican right. and I was a Republican nominee to head the Export Import Bank. And when I was uh, uh, growing up professionally in Washington, I'd always heard um, the saying, uh, XM is the bank of Boeing, or it is the bank of Kern capitalism, or um, oh, it's not very, very negative things. Yeah. And, uh, these are my friends saying this and friends who I had um, uh, in other offices. And um, I was surprised when the president, uh, President Trump asked me to go in and head XM yeah. because I did not focus on this agency. Um, the law for XM, and you can read the charter on XM's website, um, says that you need a Senate confirmed bank board of directors, a quorum of uh, three board members at least to vote on any deal at the time as any deal over $10 million, you needed to have that deal presented to the bank board to vote on. And so some uh, senators did their homework and figured out if they blocked the board nominees from getting confirmed by the Senate, then essentially Exim was uh, hobbled in a, a, a strong way. Exim by law can be lending and supporting at any one time $135 billion in exports. Mm. And, uh, and so this uh, blocking of the nominees, even though it wasn't personal, helped, uh, helped uh, XM not do that for four yeah. years. And, yeah. and uh, what happened in those four years from 2015 to 2019? China took off and yeah. China used their export credit agencies to help something called the Belt and Road Initiative around right. the world, where countries in Africa and in strategic locations buy Chinese goods and services, and they would use their export credit agencies to help finance this. Mm. And what happens, as I mentioned, if you do financing and the foreign purchaser doesn't pay up on uh, their requirements, you can acquire the asset. So how do we feel when foreign countries acquire assets around the world that are detrimental to our national security interests? That's a big concern. Do we want foreign countries operating and owning ports in places like Djibouti or Sri Lanka um, and, and, and not having our goods and services in the world? So, um, so when I was nominated, um, I was surprised because I'd never really focused on XM and I went home and did my homework and I'm like, when you're asked to serve, you think about it. But when you're asked to serve by the United States president, right. uh, you, you, uh, you, you go home and, and, and do your homework. And yeah. I decided that this is the place God had placed me, hmm. whether I knew it or not. And I'm sure all of us feel that God puts us in a place um, that's not even on our radar, but hmm. he has greater plans uh, for us. And so I was given this immense challenge. Uh, to get confirmed by the Senate and reopen this government agency after four years of near closure. Yeah. And, uh, and it took two and a half years of my life uh, to do that. 
Mm. And uh, that was really hard, but I spent a lot of time uh, with the senators to help uh, help some of them understand what China was doing, what um, how important Exim was, but also I pledged to reform and transform the agency and focus in on small business and focus in on any um, uh, project where we would protect the taxpayer to help further um, U.S. exports. I had to follow the law that was written. Yeah. And uh, after two and a half years, I finally got confirmed. But but why, why would um, some people oppose Exim? Um, purists uh, on free market principles. So if you study, uh, uh, and I know you're getting your MBA right now. So uh, a famous uh, economist, Hike, um, uh, believes, uh, he believed in not distorting uh, the marketplace and right. having government intervention um, can cause that, that distortion of free markets. And uh, these folks who are a lot of my, my dear friends believe that um, having XM distorts markets. Oh. And uh, that is true in a pure and uh, uh, ideal world. But when you have 116 countries with export credit agencies backing their workers and their companies, um, offering this so that the, those foreign countries around the world pick their products instead of America's, that, that's, that's when it's not uh, pure and, and perfect anymore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I um, uh, promised to help level the playing field. Uh, for U.S. workers. That's what they were wanting. And that's what they um, helped the president understand. And so, um, so, um, so we did that. And yeah. uh, uh, I was finally confirmed by the Senate, 79 to 17, needed 51 votes. There you go. I would have been 80, but one senator uh, was out of town and uh, she put into the record the next day that she would have voted yes on me. Oh, well, good. So <laughs> we'll count it. We'll say it was 80. It was 80. <laughs> but 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 it was it was great and yeah. a great team. And uh, hopefully uh, we did some good reforms. And, um, and I would say some of the naysayers um, said that um, they really appreciated the, the, the effort that we did. So yeah, hopefully well, I'm leaving the place in good hands. Well, I think you did. You left it with a great tagline of helping the world by American. And you mentioned your faith. And I want to talk about that in just a moment. But before that, I want to talk about China really fast, just briefly. Why, why should we be more cognizant of what China is doing in the future? You mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, which is kind of like the new Silk Road of moving their, their more military, or not military, but their political and economic power across Europe and into Africa, as you mentioned. Why should we be worried about that? And why should we be kind of ramping up our competition of economic dominance over China in the coming years? Yeah, so um, I love uh, democracy. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to be living in a, a communist country. Mm -mm. And uh, and uh, some countries have long, century-long uh, views on their strategy. Yeah. And uh, and so if you study about, uh, uh, and I would say that this is the Chinese Communist Party. I've spent a lot of time in China and uh, lovely uh, people there. But you have uh, the Chinese Communist Party. They have a grand plan. Yeah. And uh, in, uh, just Google uh, Belt and Road or China 2025, and you'll, you'll um, begin to understand if you're not in the world of national security, um, uh, how detrimental um, this is to our own national security. Mm -hmm. We are so blessed to be in this country and we have to work really hard um, to keep it uh, a, a, a democracy. And, um, and so when you see your national security interests being threatened, um, that's not a good thing. And so I, when I moved into XM, I uh, uh, recognized that economic security is national security. And, uh, and so I created a national security advisor. We plugged into the national security uh, process. Um, I worked closely with uh, Robert O'Brien, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, who was the president's national security advisor, along then with uh, you know, all, the, all the cabinet secretaries, uh, whole of government approach, economic security is national security. And, um, and uh, I uh, hope that uh, President Biden, um, we're, we're listening and watching now, um, but, uh, but he has articulated um, some things of recent of, uh, you know, what the Chinese Communist Party um, is doing. And yeah. uh, hopefully we will have a, a Senate confirmed head of XM in due course uh, to take uh, my role. 
Well, I wish he'd put you back in there. That'd be nice <laughs> just to get you back at XM. But I want to talk about your faith. You said that there are 515 staff members at Export Import that you are uh, in charge of. And how did your faith lead and guide your leadership? You knew that you were put there for a reason. You don't always know why you're put somewhere. But how did your faith guide your leadership at XM? Well, I spent two and a half years of my life trying to get the Senate to confirm me, and mm -hmm. it happened like that. Right. Uh, just, just after two and a half years, boom, there, there, it finally happened. And uh, when you were uh, confirmed by the Senate, uh, the White House presidential personnel told me, you always have about two weeks from when the Senate votes yes on you and confirms you for the paperwork to go to the White House for them to sign off on all the paperwork for you then to be able to go into the uh, agency take your oath of office mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and um, you know and and start your job two weeks wow. and uh, uh, President Trump wanted uh, XM uh, in such a strong way to get going and help help uh, American companies uh, compete and win in the world that uh, when I was confirmed, um, that happened on May uh, 8th of 2019. Uh, so I'd worked for two and a half years of my life. It happens on May 8th. I'm so overjoyed. I go visit all my West Virginia senators and congressmen and um, come home that evening, went out to dinner with some friends, and then wake up the next morning, and I am in my Nike on at this very table that I'm at right now, yeah. sending emails to a lot of people because I was confirmed the Senate put me on the calendar and it just happened, boom, yeah. and no, no, not a lot of warning. And uh, so I'm emailing hundreds of people who helped me uh, get to this very important uh, moment in my life and in the life of this uh, agency. And I'm seated at this table in my Nike on, 9 a.m. in the morning, my phone rings and I look at my phone and it says, you know, White House. And I'm like, mm -hmm. hello. <laughs> and someone's on the other end. And, uh, and, and, and she says, uh, Kim, we've never seen this before ever, but the president immediately signed your paperwork last night and you have one hour to get to the <laughs> office and take your oath. No. And get to work. Yeah. One hour and I'm in my night cam <laughs> and, uh, and all of the staff are going to be waiting for you right in the big conference room for you to take your oath. You're probably going to need remarks to, to share. <laughs> You're going to need things to say and get ready. Oh my oh, goodness. So what did I do? Like, you know, when people take their oaths, uh, they have their family with them. They put right. their hand on the Bible. It's very meaningful. And my father, Terry Reed, who lives four hours from here, had been looking forward to this moment for a long, 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 long time. He's very right. proud of me. And so I'm like stunned and I call him up and I'm like, daddy, I love you, but you're missing it. And uh, I get yeah. in the shower and then I get out of the shower and then I'm like, oh, I need a Bible. Uh -huh. and my family Bible is in Buchanan with my dad, oh, the yeah. one I want to take the oath on. Oath, oath on. And, uh, and so I look at my bookcase and I'm like, what is the oldest Bible or, you know, historically most relevant Bible, all Bibles right, right, right. are important, but what one do I want to use? And so I looked at all my Bibles and I, I had this one from 1990 mm. that my poppers gave me. So I would have uh, just been in college because uh, I graduated high school in uh, 1989. So my poppers, uh, Max Reed gave this to me on Christmas 1990. And, uh, and uh, so I grab it and I'm like, okay, this is the one. And then I'm like, I look at it and uh, Zach, I'll show you. And I don't know if you can see this. Okay. okay. So, so it says 19, uh, Christmas, 1990. 90, yeah. Then my grandfather wrote a little note here and he pasted some things in my Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never paid attention to this handwritten note. Yeah. Right here. So I'm looking at it as I need to be in the car, getting down the street in a dress with makeup on and a speech. Right. Um, and so it says, Dear Kim, I trust and pray this Bible will always be an inspiration to you. You should always read your Bible daily. I refer you to 2 Timothy 2.15. Mm. May God bless you with a long and happy life, poppers. Mm. And so I started crying just like this because right. I felt like my grandfather. I never appreciated that as I did in this moment when I was about to do the biggest thing in my life alone with no family with me. 
And so I flipped to Second Timothy two fifteen. Do you know what Second Timothy two fifteen says? I'm, I'm was racking my brain trying to figure it. Out. I know, uh, I don't it, exactly. What's it say? It says, "Do your best to present yourself to God mm-hmm. as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth." Mm. So. I felt um, really strong and I felt my job was to tell the truth about XM and that meant on all, you know, all the different uh, 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 positions on this to help. What are the facts? What's the truth? How do we reform? How do we do good things for our country um, in the world and through democracy? And so um, I got in my car, took this Bible drove i know that we're being recorded but maybe i went a little fast that's okay, and that's maybe, okay. We'll maybe, maybe i put my makeup on as i was driving and writing my speech and calling people uh, and uh and flew right into the uh, export import bank's garage got out of the garage got in an elevator went out got on a stage in front of all of my new colleagues mm-hmm. and had to give a speech and so um I wore the engagement ring of my great grandmother. Um, I don't have it here with me, but it has a letter uh, R on it and her uh, her wedding date on the inside. Mm. And it's a signet ring. And so I like, what am I going to give my speech about? I'm wearing an R. I am here. Hello, everyone. I'm here to reopen this agency, yeah. reform this agency, give results to the American people while protecting the taxpayer. So, and also to get us reauthorized, because I had to deal with that as well. That's a congressional term for getting your, your uh, agency uh, extended for right. a time period. And I got our uh, agency reauthorized for the longest amount in the history of Axim of seven years through 2026. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so that's a little bit about um, uh, the, the approach I brought uh, yeah. in the word of God that uh, took me on uh, that, that great journey. What a beautiful story of just the way there's so many times in life that uh, we so quickly move by because the pace of life and how we move from one thing to the next that we're not able to uh, enjoy those small things that the Lord has truly, I mean, he's used other people, he's used uh, people in your life to write a note that you had never seen until probably the most important moment of your life up to that point and to point you to his word and to, to remind you to correctly handle the word of truth. Like it says in Second Timothy two fifteen, it's just a reminder to always be be listening to that still small voice of the Lord of where He's going to point you, where He's encouraging you. As as I can't imagine the the nerves you had, what you you were mentally going through in those moments, but just that letter saying, "Hey Kim, I'm with you. I'm here. You're gonna be okay. I've got your back. Just correctly handle the word of truth and do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and correctly handles the word of truth. That's such a beautiful story. And thank you uh, so much for sharing that with us. And I have just one more question I wanna ask you. It's what we love asking all our leaders is what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Just kind of that reflective question as you look back on your career that you've done all these things, you've, you've worked with some amazing people, but what is the piece of advice you would give to your 20 year old self? Well, I feel like I heeded the advice. I want uh, all of the 20 year olds uh, listening uh, to, 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 to listen. So let me say that first, which is yeah. put yourself out there and uh and do everything you can you will get help and i wish i would have known this um and i still have to remind myself this as i look at the next chapter of my own life but you're going to get help from people that you don't know that um and the difference that comes to you will be by people who you do not expect to help you and the people you expect to help you won't and so you've got to put yourself out there and 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 meet those people to help uh, help you um continue on in your career so um so uh don't sit at home do 110 percent when you're tired uh too bad get out there and 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 go for it because um part of being a successful professional is not making A's in school. Hmm. I can't tell you how many people I know who've made A's in schools who are not 
as successful um, as they could have been, or I thought they would have been professionally because they lacked people skills, they lacked drive, they lacked common sense. Um, so it's more than getting A's. Mm. And, uh, and I would say, read, um, read, um, read the newspaper, read about things you don't know enough about, stay informed as you get ready to go for interviews. Um, I grew up in rural West Virginia. Um, and how did I uh, 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 get to where I am? Uh, it's hard, hard work, but also uh, uh, when you're an intern, just don't Xerox the papers and just don't answer the phone. Like engage your brain, seem interested, and be interested right. in, uh, in what's surrounding you. Um, and um, someone also told me, just get on the merry-go-round. It doesn't matter where, just get on. Don't wait for that perfect job. Um, that happened to me after I graduated from law school. I, I uh, was a lawyer and I worked on a presidential campaign, the Bob Dole 1996 campaign. Oh, yeah. He lost. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to get in the, on the Hill. And I sat uh, uh, at home for five months, no one calling me or, or wanting to interview me. And someone uh, figuratively kicked me in the pants and said, just get on that merry-go-round. So yeah. I put in an application as a lawyer to be an intern. And I was hired by a, a, a very nice uh, Congressman, Sonny Callahan. He just passed uh, from Alabama, near Mobile, Alabama. And, uh, and I worked hard at a front desk, answering phones and doing very basic tasks. But I showed that I was dedicated and, and had a brain to focus in. And, and that opened doors for getting your next stop. So anyway, that's a, that's a, uh, and then what, let me think real hard. What, what would I have wished someone would have told me? I, I would tell myself at age 20 beyond those things. Um, I think it would be, um, do all you can. Do all you can. Just get on the merry-go-round. Don't yeah. wait for that perfect moment. Put yourself out there. Read. Be educated. Be use every opportunity as a way to learn and to grow and be ready for that next experience yeah. or that next thing that's going to come your way because you never know when it's coming. And, and, and keep an open heart to it because could I have uh, foreseen anything in my professional career? No. And it's one experience leads to an X, leads to an X. My first job on the Hill was working on the Education Workforce Committee. And I knew nothing about labor law, very little about education issues, mm -hmm. but I was a, a, a oversight counsel. And from that experience, I worked hard. And what I learned back in the late 90s from looking at the future of the American workplace, I wrote a report on uh, the future of the American workplace. I had that report in my office at XM. And wow. I showed that report to a U.S. Labor uh, Secretary. He's like, oh my goodness, we're still dealing with these issues. Yeah. But if it would have been the perfect job, I, I couldn't have even uh, foreseen that. But, but just get on and learn and you'll be surprised. You'll have uh, things that you like, things you might not like at all that um, um, uh, you, you get clarity on that, but you might be surprised of what you excel at. Mm, I love it. Just get on the merry-go-round. You never know the ride it's going to take you on. Kim, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. It's been an honor to speak with you. Thank you, Zach. Bless you.